this presentation, uh, we look at the role of pharmacoeconomics in developing clinical guidelines. So uh, I mentioned this yesterday, but for those who were not here, uh, pharmacoeconomics is the description and the analysis of the cost of drug therapy. Sorry, I need to... Uh, yeah. So the pharmacoeconomics is the description and the analysis of the cost of the drug therapy to healthcare systems and society. It is a somehow, as I mentioned before, a sub-discipline of health economics that compares the cost and the consequences of drugs and pharmaceutical products and services. So every time we need to choose between a new intervention and a comparator, which is what is the current standard, we need to compare them both in terms of their cost and their consequences and effects. Now, there are some questions that can be answered through pharmacoeconomics. For example, what therapeutical areas should be targeted for drug development? Um, should new drugs be developed or added to formulary? What is the drug's cost in relation to clinical benefit? Should new drugs be reimbursed or covered by the national plan? But more essential, um, how can we use the pharmacoeconomics to develop new clinical guidelines? And the role of NICE, uh, as I just mentioned, is to uh, give uh, uh, evidence uh, in order to develop these new guidelines. But what is a guideline? A guideline is uh, a recommendation, is an evidence-based recommendation for health and health care. It is uh, um, uh, developed in a very systematic way, is a document that is designed to help uh, healthcare providers, uh, uh, clinicians, and patients decide on appropriate health care in any specific circumstances. It enables individuals with different backgrounds to agree about health care and pathways and to get a quality framework against which such care can be measured. Um, they're also used to assist policymakers in making informed decisions about uh, uh, how to assess uh, healthcare costs. Um, the guidelines set out the care and the services that are most suitable for people with a specific condition or with a need, um, the care and the services suitable for particular populations, so groups of people in particular circumstances, and uh, it is a way to promote and protect the good health or prevent ill health. So the, it sets out also the configuration and the provision of healthcare and social care services and how national and local public sector organizations and partnership can improve the quality of care and the services. So for example, in the NHS, how the NHS and the social care services can work together. Now, there are some key principles for developing guidelines, at least in the UK. They are based on the best uh, available evidence of what works and what uh, it costs. Uh, they are developed uh, by independent uh, and uh, unbiased committees of experts. In the UK, the NICE committee included two lay members, some people with personal experience uh, of using health and healthcare services, uh, so patients and carers, or from a community affected by the guideline. Um, regular consultations allow organizations and individuals to comment on these nice recommendations. So there are committees where you can actually attend as a public to see how guidelines are made. And once they are published, all nice guidelines are regularly checked um, and uh, uh, updated in the light of new evidence or intelligence if it is necessary. There are some clear stages of guideline uh, development. So um, you uh, start from a specific topic that is obviously decided by NICE. And uh, there's a scoping uh, phase where the developer drafts the scope of uh, uh, the questions. Then the guideline is developed. And during this process, uh, there's a review of questions that is agreed. Um, there's a literature search to see what is already available. Uh, you, there's a call for evidence from stakeholders if it's needed. And then uh, um, the uh, evidence is reviewed and there's an economic analysis which is uh, prepared. 
And then the committee discuss the evidence and then they go ahead with a consultation on a draft guideline and the guideline is revised, is a sign off at NICE and then it is a published and regularly updated. So my work very much uh, consists uh, in uh, uh, providing evidence on the economic part. As you can see here, it has happened to me in the past uh, that NICE has asked me to provide some economic models uh, uh, to update a guideline on uh, treatment for stroke, for example. So what is the role of pharmacoeconomics uh, in the guidelines development uh, when we are talking obviously about drugs? It compares the cost and the consequences of alternative drugs and treatments. It measures the health outcomes to account for quality of life, survival, and patients' needs. And it measures uh, the cost effectiveness of these uh, treatments and drugs. So the first stage uh, in this uh, sense to create guidelines is to do a literature review. A literature review of what is the published evidence. Uh, in uh, this stage, we determine uh, whether the review questions have already been uh, answered uh, to identify and present and appraise data from uh, studies of uh, cost effectiveness. We may, oh, sorry, may be considered as a part of each uh, review question undertaking for a guideline and if existing evidence uh, is uh, not adequate or not conclusive, uh, then there is a second stage. In the second stage, uh, we adapt existing models uh, uh, to understand how uh, uh, the disease uh, impact uh, and how the drugs can um, be cost effective. If there's no existing model available, we need to model a new model um, uh, and uh, develop it and design it and populate uh, with the data. So this is the reference case, which is a public uh, publicly available in the NICE uh, guidelines uh, um, uh, methods and uh, there are different steps. I'm going to go through them uh, quickly so that you know what it entails. The first uh, uh, thing to do every time you need to develop a guideline is uh, to um, near, uh, clearly define what is the objective uh, and the intervention. Whether it's an intervention in primary care, for example, um, uh, in a, an application, a technology, uh, a exercises, uh, community interventions. And then we need to define the comparator. And so something that is already available as in, uh, uh, in the case of uh, drugs, uh, what is uh, the standard uh, care? or in some cases uh, even uh, doing nothing. For example, if we are introducing a new screening uh, intervention or a vaccination. Um, then the other thing we need to look at is the perspective on costs. Perspective is essential in pharmacoeconomics because it uh, um, makes a difference in terms of which cost we should include. So there are different uh, uh, point of view depending on who do you want to inform, whether it's the NHS, uh, an hospital, uh, or a society. So these are examples uh, of different perspectives and how different perspectives uh, include different costs in the, in the analysis. So depending on whether we only consider the NHS or other sector of the economy, we will include different costs. And uh, from a broader perspective, uh, we should also include the cost for families, caregivers, uh, and uh, uh, productivity losses uh, for the society. The rule is that the, the, in the um, uh, economic evaluation is performed adopting the NHS perspective, but if possible, um, to provide uh, some uh, uh, separate uh, indications of what is the impact for society. Then we start measuring cost. As I mentioned yesterday, this includes the cost of the intervention and the resources used uh, to provide the intervention. This is quite straightforward uh, because uh, it is a simple cost analysis. Um, and then we have perspective on outcomes. Outcomes that can be measured, as I mentioned yesterday, in different ways. In monetary benefits, uh, if we do a cost benefit analysis, uh, in terms of effects, so exacerbations, number of years uh, we live uh, without the conditions, but also uh, utility if we take into account of quality of life and the disability. 
So there are obviously different types of economic evaluation depending on whether there's a difference or not in the effects. So if there's no difference, uh, we have a cost minimization analysis. Uh, and in these terms, uh, um, uh, it's very frequent to do that uh, in, in with uh, generic drugs. But most of the time, the effects of a new drug are uh, generally higher and better. And so the type of analysis will very much depend on which uh, uh, effect measure we use. So if it's in monetary terms, we have cost-benefit analysis. If it's in a physical units, a cost-effectiveness. And if we take into account utility, then we have a cost-utility analysis. The uh, seventh point uh, is the quality adjusted life years. Uh, this is a measure that incorporates uh, a change in survival and the changes in quality of life. Uh, one quality is one year lived in perfect health. And we can measure these uh, using the Eurocall EQ5D questionnaires uh, to compare treatments uh, within uh, and between patients group. Uh, this is an example of the EQ5D uh, Eurocall questionnaires uh, there are two versions, the 3L and the 5L. Uh, they both look at five dimensions of health, mobility, self-care, usual activities, pain, and uh, mental health. Um, the difference between the two is that one has a three levels of answer, whereas the 5L has five levels of answer and is more recent and should be used in all new studies. So uh, once uh, the patients are administered the questionnaire, they um, compile the questionnaire and basically they come up with a, a health profile, depending on how they answer. And from this health profile, there is an algorithm that calculates what is uh, the utility, so how well they are in that particular state. And this is used to um, uh, calculate the qualities. The ninth point is the synthesis of the evidence. This uh, is very much uh, uh, provided uh, through randomized control trials data uh, and also with the systematic uh, literature review. The, um, when, uh, as we said, there's uh, not enough evidence, uh, what uh, uh, we do as health economists is uh, we uh, build models uh, uh, but even if we have evidence from randomized controlled trials and we want to see what happens beyond the trial, we tend to use uh, decision modeling in the form of decision trees and Markov models. So uh, decision trees are very useful for, for uh, acute conditions uh, where the time frame is quite short. Um, uh, whereas the Markov models are very much used for chronic conditions uh, uh, or for complex interventions. They both provide uh, uh, estimations of uh, cost and outcomes over time, and uh, they come up with uh, the difference in cost and difference in effects of uh, a new intervention compared to uh, a, a standard one. There is another point which is uh, extremely important, which is the time horizon. So uh, for how long should the cost uh, uh, be tracked? For how long should the model be run? It depends on the perspective. Generally, hospitals are very interested in the short-term discharge, uh, whereas other healthcare agencies are interested in the mid-term and the uh, societal perspective should look actually at the lifetime of patients. In general, we should have a, a time horizon which is long enough to see all the difference in outcomes and cost between the new intervention and the comparator. This has implications in terms of discounting because for costs and outcomes which occurs after one year, we should uh, um, give more weight to the present cost and the outcomes and less weight to future cost and outcomes. So the cost effectiveness results should reflect the present value of the stream of cost and benefits uh, over the time horizon of the analysis. Uh, and for the reference case, uh, NICE suggests to discount with a 3.5 discount rate, uh, both costs and benefits. The discount rate is generally set at national level. So each country will have a different discount rate. 
Then once we have a cost and outcome, so we need to make a decision and understand whether the new intervention is cost effective. And we can represent that in this uh, uh, graph where we have the difference in effects on the horizontal axis. So going right, we have more health and the difference in cost on the vertical axis. So going up, we are spending more. Obviously those interventions which are over uh, down here, where you have a more effect and you spend less. They are all dominant intervention because they can be easily approved. Those who are on the other side, so where you spend more and you get less health, are obviously dominated and uh, they are always rejected. And the health economics uh, comes uh, uh, in uh, these two other quadrants uh, where you have to spend more to get more health or you have to give up health to save money. So how much uh, should we willing to spend more or to give up health depends on our willingness and ability to spend and depends on our budget. So uh, if you uh, use this line to represent our budget, everything that is below this line is acceptable and everything that is above is not acceptable. So by changing this uh, threshold, you get different results. Um, so how much we want to spend depends uh, on the uh, uh, national ability to pay for additional health benefits uh, and uh, in the UK is decided using uh, the ICER threshold. So all those interventions where the ICER, which is the ratio between the difference in cost and difference in effects uh, of a new intervention is below £20,000 per quality. So it means that we need to uh, spend £20,000 more if we want to, to implement the new drugs or intervention to gain one extra year of life in full quality of life, then this is acceptable. Between twenty and £30,000 needs uh, additional uh, justification and above £30,000 uh, generally it's unlikely that intervention is going to be accepted. Every country has different thresholds. So in the US is around $50,000. Uh, in Europe uh, is between 30 and 50,000 euros. In other countries, uh, uh, according to the World Health Organization, it depends on their GDP and their ability to uh, pay uh, nationally. Yes, to conclude, uh, Pharmacoeconomics uh, is a fundamental in the approval of drugs and medication so that they can be available through the NHS. It has a fundamental role in the development of uh, clinical guidelines. There are obviously some limits and challenges in the evaluation of uh, uh, drug cost effectiveness, uh, which has to do with the uh, data availability, with the qualities and threshold, but somehow uh, this discipline is essential. Obviously, uh, I want to conclude saying that decisions should not only be based on cost effectiveness alone. Other factors such as the need to prevent discrimination and to promote equity should also be taken into account. And I think that we are working towards that. Thank you so much for the attention. I'm happy to take questions. Okay, um, we will take questions.